We do not lose heart, seeing that the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. That was last week in chapter 4. We do welcome you this morning to the house and a great crowd everywhere, up in the balcony everywhere. It is Father's Day. If you're a dad, a granddad, or a great-granddad, would you stand and let us honor you this morning, all of our dads, great-granddads, granddad, papas. God bless you, men. That's a lot of men. Amen. This generation needs men. Uh, if, if my daughters would have been here today, we would have sang Daddy's Hands. We've sang it together for years. Jan loves it because it, was the, it is the relationship she had with her daddy. She came along real late in life. Both of her older brothers were already grown, so they doted on her. She was spoiled absolutely to death, by, uh, and her daddy would take her everywhere she went. But there's a line from that song, Daddy's hands, soft and kind when I was crying, Daddy's hands, Heart as steel when I had done wrong. And her daddy was that way. He was tall. He was imposing. I was scared of him till the day that he died. Um, one day, one Sunday night, we were coming home from church. I had borrowed his truck. I always had to borrow everything. I borrowed his boat, borrowed his daughter's truck, everything. And uh, we were coming home from church, and a drunk was parked in the side of the road, on, on, on the middle of the road, sound asleep, and we hit him head on. And uh, when the police got to her dad, and he got there when he was approaching a truck. We were, we were okay. We were shaking up, ruined the pickup truck. Three city cops ran from their cars and bulldogged Mr. Hatcher, took him down because they knew what was about to happen, and that's the kind of daddy he was. Soft and kind when I was crying, hard as steel when I had done wrong. And so uh, we need men today. God, help us. We need men to stand. The, the, the things that, that we are seeing and putting ourselves through emotionally because of a lack and a vacuum of men being men, uh, television and Hollywood went out of, uh, to, to, uh, to neuter us more than 20 years ago, taking manhood out of any place. And then uh, the, the feminism uh, thing came in which we don't really need a man for anything. And so... Uh, the world has done everything they can to denigrate the manhood of man. So I thank you men for standing and, and, and being the man of God that you need to be. So here we are. Uh, while the old man is, is dying every day, the inward man is being renewed day by day. And that's such an important phrase because all of grace comes day by day. All of God's mercy is day by day. His, while they're unlimited in nature, they're still moment by moment and day by day. He had no idea. When I, I got a call uh, just yesterday uh, from Miss Dina. They had no idea when they went to bed the night before their house was going to burn down. I mean, everything is day by day. You don't know what's going to happen to you tomorrow. You don't know how you're going to feel, which ER you're going to be in, or, or what's about to go on in your life. So it's day by day by day. The outward man is perishing, but the new, the, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Then he moves into chapter 5, verse 1. For we know, K-N-O-W, the Greek word ginosko, I've come to understand it and can trust on it. This is one of those words that is emphatic. It is not a, I'm kind of thinking. It is not a wish so. It is ginosko. I've come to know. What do I know? That if our earthly house, this tent, what do you think? When you see a beautiful shelter like this, what do you think? What's the number one thing about this shelter? Beach? temporary. It's temporary, right? I mean, there's nothing there. There's just nothing there. It's temporary. What does he say in chapter 5, verse 1? For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, the word destroyed comes from a Hebrew word that talks about when Moses would have the, the man sound the shofar, the whoo horn, and then strike the tents. And everyone would get up, and they would strike the tent. And the first thing that had to go was the beautiful tabernacle. It was the first thing that had to go. And the first thing in the tabernacle that left when they would strike the tents was the Ark of the Covenant. And he's likening this to that. This, this is an earthly tent. It's temporary. But here's the problem with every one of us. We keep putting all of our world in this tent. 
We keep believing that everything we're going through, it's got to fit inside of this. It must fit inside this enclosure. Why? Because we live for today. And, and everything about us is trying to achieve in today's time what God never meant for us to do in, in, in our time. So if you attempt to put all of your life into the temporary, in other words, the, the people who are trying to save whales, I love whales. I think they should be saved. But I think I, when I get a glass of tea at the store and I, and I need a straw, I want a straw too. Because the straw is not going to save the whale. I get the picture, but there's never any logic to their thinking. So here's the thing. While I understand that and their deep passion, because they don't believe that there's anything but this tent, folks. They don't believe in the song that Britt wrote. Their, their temporary is permanent. Everything about their life is going to have to go into the temporary because that's all there is. That's why they're so consumed with saving this planet, with saving the whales, with saving anything they can except unborn babies. Amen. Now, so if I don't believe, chapter 5, verse, therefore, if my earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. He continues the contrast about that he had in chapter 4 with on into chapter 5. Here, this thing is temporary, and it would be okay for, uh, for a few days, and it would be kind of rough to change clothes in there. Uh, it would be kind of rough to, to get through a, a winter in there. Why? It's temporary, not designed for that. But look at the contrast. For we know if the tent is struck, destroyed, strike the tent, we've got another one. And I couldn't put another one over here. You know why? Because it says it's not made with hands, so I can't show it to you. There's no earthly description of what that will be, but there are four uh, descriptives of it. Uh, we have a building from God. So apparently, it's a permanent structure. It's got permanence to it. John said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. If it were not true, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. Now, I, and that's all. That's all that's said. That's all we know. Now we know Revelation talks about this, this house, but there's permanence too. Not only is there permanence in the building from God, it's a house not made with hands. Describe or define that. How do you make something that you can live in and it's not made with these? Now see, that's already above your understanding. Even Al can't do that, you know. He can't make something that you can't see. He can't give you the house. I was sitting in uh, back in the, the uh, first Alma days years and years and years ago, sitting right on the interstate back in the day. We always got people off the interstate. Man came right in off the door uh, at the interstate right through the door, and he said, I want to see the pastor. I just walked on out. I said, what can I do for you, buddy? And he said, uh, I want to show you my, my art, and I'm hoping that you'd buy one of my pictures. I said, well, hey, I love art. Uh, and so uh, he uh, got his backpack down and he pulled out a sheet of typing paper and he laid it right on my desk. And I looked at it and I said, well, is it a snowstorm? It's a blank piece of paper. Nothing on it. He said, can't you see it? Mm. Yeah, I had one of those. You know, Can't you see it? Best way to handle one of those is find $20 as fast as you can, get them back out on the interstate where they can help somebody else. I bought that piece of paper for $20. I framed it for a while, and people laughed at it, and I threw it away. We're going to have all sorts of people that want to see something that's not there. We've got all sorts of people that are seeing things uh, that, that won't see things that are there, and that's, that's where this culture is today. Uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals this past week said about the two churches that had filed suit against had filed suit against them, and they said, "Well, yeah, you can meet, but you're just like a dance hall or anything else, uh, or going to the movies. They can't meet at all. So ten people is enough for you." And so they lost lost the case. This past week, the United States Supreme Court did something they've never done in their history. I mean, it threw legislate it threw everyone back. 
how, how that they could go back from a 1964 law and say, no, now it means this. Never happened before in our country. So there are so many things that are going on in this country that we're attempting to put all of our life in this temporary. And it's never going to work. You're never going to be able to hold it all. How many of you know a hoarder? I mean, somebody just won't let go of anything. What do you do with the hoarder? Because the moment, would you like to get rid of this? Oh, no, no. You ever watch American Pickers? It's the most frustrating show in the world. Here's a guy come off the street and offer you $300 for something that's been un- laying in that junk pile for 20 No, I can't. I just can't. I just can't. See, that's what we're doing when we put everything in our life in the temporary. And that's why we mourn all loss so much because we, we don't want to lose. And, and Paul is saying to these folks, listen, if this tent is struck, there is another that's coming for you that is permanent, that is made without hands, that is eternal, meaning everlasting, and is in the heavens. So we're going to have to swap this for that someday. There's going to be a point by which you leave this earth. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to go from the, the temporary to the eternal? Now, in, in verse 2, there are only two lessons that we want to teach today. They are we groan and we are confident. We, we, we are groaning because we recognize our limitations. And we as believers recognize our limitations. We are in a world that has come against us. But listen, folks, in America, while we are watching the absolute takedown uh, of, of a culture, and we are in it up to, our, uh, up to our eyeballs in a cultural warfare now on everything you can imagine. It's not just about abortion anymore. It's about everything. The, the thing that will take down the American church uh, and I'm not a prophet, but I'm saying this will be the number one issue. It's going to be genderism. It's going to be, are we going to call this a sin or not? It will be the Achilles heel for the church of tomorrow because on every side they are pressed from every form and system of government. The reason we didn't want to take any stimulus money as a church is because the moment you take money from the United States government, they also have a thing that they can say, now you need to conform to all of these statutes because you have taken them, but they've done it and done it and done it over and over and over again. There'll never be a moment by which the mountaintop cowboy church will say, government, we need you. We can't make it without you. Government, we have to have you. There'll never be a moment that we'll say we would rather, we would rather come before our government and ask for help because he is our resource. He is the one who's prepared for us that which we cannot see because we are all hooked up in the, in the, in the temporal. And so there is this in verse 2, for we groan, we are groaning, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation. What is that about? Clothes are pretty important, you know. Here's the thing about Greek philosophers, though. They thought the highest state of a spirit was a, a, a bodiless spirit. That was the high. There was no need for a resurrection that we're talking about here in this book. They didn't believe in that. They believed that that was the highest form of existence would, would be a naked or unclothed spirit. And so Paul is fighting that. And he says, listen, believers are groaning today. And, and we are, and, and he uses the word earnestly desiring, groaning, earnestly desiring, earnestly desiring earnestly desiring. When we want to see God work in our life, there must be an earnest desire and there's a groan. A groan is an, is an unheard cry. And all of you have groaned before. Many times it says of Jesus that, that he groaned. It's the lamentation of the soul by which we're not crying. We just, oh, earnestly desiring that we can swap out the temporary or the eternal. You say, I don't want to die. I understand that. And it would be wrong for us, and we would have a wrong mindset if we were to say, I, I, want, I want to die, and I want to, I want to enhance that or take it a step forward and kill myself so that I can go. 
That's not what he's talking about at all. The human spirit fights to live. But he's saying that we groan or we earnestly desire that we could see, do, and be more. In fact, it goes on, if you're looking in verse 5, there is a 100% money-back guarantee that he gives us on this swap. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever bought anything that had a 100% guarantee because if you buy anything online now, it is, it's a 30-day, but you pay for it first because they know most of us can't get through the procedure to get the money back, and we just forget about it. That's not God's policy. It's a 100% money-back guarantee, and it's found, if you look with me in verse 5, now he who prepared us for this very thing, what very thing is it? Getting from here to here. We have to get from temporal, temporary to permanent. We have to be able to say in our mind, this is okay, let it go. Uh, when I see, and I don't know if, if, if uh, one thumb, you put up the pictures of the, the, the devil. I saw two little children at a, and they tried to put this, this same uh, statue up in Little Rock, uh, the devil, uh, and the, they want to put it up in Oklahoma City. Hey, you want to throw down a couple of memorials? There's one for you. Amen. They will win this battle. They've already won it twice. They'll win this battle in which they will be able. This is a, a, a memorial to, to Lucifer, son of the morning, from Isaiah 14. When we see that, our blood boils. We get mad. We kick around. We stomp. We tell one another how ticked off we are. And then we have to remember, wait a minute. This, this is not our world. This is not ours. We know who we are. We know that we have this house that is turning into this house. This is another world. And friends, the longer I live in this world, the stranger it's getting. And I know that we're strangers passing through. And I, I understand the spiritual principle to that. But when I see uh, the workings of, of an ignorant society saying, all we have to do to remake America is tear down its past. Popular Mechanics this past month had an article on how to take down a statue. They gave the first way. If that doesn't work, go to the ankles of the statue, use a, a whatever kind of bit it was they said to use, and then fill it with liquid nit nitrogen. It, it will become so cold the knees will crack, it will be weak, and it will come over easy. That's Popular Mechanics magazine telling these weirdos how to destroy our past. Our past was not put there for us to vote on upon agreement. Our past was put there, whether it's right or wrong, to say we should never, ever go back to that or look to that or to do that. That's all past is for. And if you destroy that, it's like taking everything that the church has ever had and destroying it, saying we want all new church. We want everything new. And by the way, part of the problem that we're experiencing now in this new paradigm is that. Pastors who are saying it's not important to come back together. We'll just stay online because after all, that's, that's joining together. Well, the writer of Hebrews said uh, that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Well, they say we're assembling together online. It's not sustainable. And we talked about that last week. We won't go back there again. But the church was made to meet. It was made to meet. It was there with purpose. It was there for us to recognize everything we're doing is temporary. Everything we want to fix in the church in Kansas is going to break again. We're going to have to go to work around here and fix a lot of things. Why? It's the nature of all things to go down. Everything's going to go down. So temporary, permanent. And when we look at this 100% money-back guarantee, you know what it is? It's the Holy Spirit. Look at it. Now, he who has prepared us for this and this is the very God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Now, folks, what could you walk out of this room with any greater assurance of that if you are born again, you are redeemed, you have Jesus Christ living in you, then you have a 100% money-back guarantee that what? Yeah, go to heaven. That was in the first, first phase of it. You know what this guarantee is? The, it's, a, it's an unusual word. The Greek word erabon means a partial payment 
that required future payments, but gave the one receiving the guarantee a legal claim to the products in question. Now put that together. What is Arabon? It's a partial payment that required future payments, but gave the one receiving the guarantee a legal claim to the goods in question. Modern Greek, if you were to say Arabon, you know what it is? It's an engagement ring. That's the word. So in modern terms, it's an engagement ring, but in ancient terms, it was a guarantee, a partial payment with more coming, but one that said you also have legal claim to all the goods in question. What is he saying to you as a believer in Jesus Christ? You have legal claim to every promise that's here. Everything that's ever been said about any believer is going to come true in you. So from the temporary to the eternal, there is a guarantee. And that's what we all get. In fact, we, American Christianity is just angry right now. We're, we're angry. Not only are our rights being trampled on and, and a lot of governors and mayors are writing laws that uh, the city of Fayetteville just passed one, city council just this past week. You cannot come into their town, go into any store, go into anything without uh, a mask on. Uh, for any purpose, or you violate a city code ordinance, Little Rock is considering the same thing. Now, um, the and and I'm not angry about masks. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is city of governments and state governments and federal governments that are washing over constitutional law that made America great and who we are. So we're angry about this stuff, but we have to keep rem- reminding ourselves daily. Wait a minute, this is not who we are. Yes, we. Uh, I think we're going to have the, the COVID misery till about November the 3rd. Uh, I, I think that things will let up right then. And I love the, the, the science of COVID-19 that in riots there is no problem and there is no spread of disease. That's an amazing thing. What they've come. We're never going to have a press that comes to church and say, we love you American Christians. We love you. Listen, the press is not a Christian organization. They don't love God. They're not believers. Now, some of them are, of course. But they have an agenda to everything they say. There, there's a point and a, and, a, and a strategy to get America to buy into the e temporary of all things. Get it all while you can because you're not going to be around much longer. Therefore, there are two things we'll study this morning and then we'll close. This 100% money-back guarantee. Do you all believe that this morning? I don't think you do. Turn with me to Ephesians 1, 13. Let me give you another scripture. In him you also trusted, and you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also have believed that you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Now, what did I just say to you a moment ago? That's what a guarantee is. A a partial payment requiring future payments, but the one receiving the guarantee has legal right to the products in question. That's what God has given us in the Holy Spirit. So stop worrying about all the devil worshipers. Stop worrying about a media that is uh, satanic inspired. Stop worrying about uh, the, the congressmen and congresswomen and the speakers of the house that have lost their ever-loving mind. Stop worrying about them. Why? We are not of this world. We will never be of this world. And that's what they hate the very most, that somehow we think we're really cool because we're over here. Now, most of them have built million, million-dollar homes, billion, billionaires and all of that. But what I'm saying is they look at believers Oh, you guys think you've got it. You're just going to get all of this and all of that, and then you're going to get to go to heaven. You can act any way you want to act. You can say anything you want to say, uh, and, and then just tell Jesus, I'm sorry. Then he takes you to heaven, and you're a billionaire the rest of your life. Now, we all know that that's not true. That's not what grace does. That's not what mercy is, but that's how the world looks at it, and that's why to us, we are foolish. Paul said, to the world, this is the foolishness. Because when the world hears it, it is foolishness to them. So that's the guarantee. And uh, while we are at home in this body, he talks about, 
We're absent from the Lord. And this is part we're going to walk by faith. So let's look at this. We groan, verse 2, 3, and 4. Earnestly desiring for our new clothes of righteousness. In other words, we're not desiring to become more self-righteous over here. Could, could, could I possibly be more self-righteous? Could I, I bring more attention to myself about anything? That's what self-righteousness is. We're groaning over here in the tent because we want to be more. And see, that's the one thing I know that is true. You wouldn't be here today if you weren't desiring to hear more and have more and know more of Jesus Christ. I wouldn't be either. The river is down. I could be fishing. I earnestly desire, that's the groan of the Spirit given to us by the Holy Spirit that's living within us. And you know another reason, see, the world doesn't get us. They, they, keep, they, they keep slapping us around, moving us, knocking us around, and thinking that we're going to show the other side of us, the real side of believers. Y'all are just like we are. And so they continue to push and push and push. You've got people in your workforce that do that. They know you're a believer. They just keep pushing on you a little bit. See how, oh, so I thought you was a real Christian. I thought you was a real believer. And so we earnestly contend not to be more self-righteous. We earnestly contend wishing we could be better, wishing we could be more righteous. And that's what he says, wishing we had more of those, those clothes of righteousness that came to us through the work of Jesus Christ. So he says, we groan greatly desiring that we might be clothed in righteousness. The second groan is being burdened, verse 4, because we want more of that. Being, being burdened down, we're not getting any farther. We're not going to get any, anywhere past where we are. Did you know that you are as 100% complete in Jesus Christ as you ever will be? You're not ever going to get any better. You say, oh, Lord, thanks for, that <laughs> thanks for that encouragement. You're 100% complete because when you came to Christ at the cross, you received that promise and the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the guarantee of the Holy Spirit, He has been with you every step of the way. You are as forgiven as you're ever going to be. You are as righteous as you're ever going to be. Now, because of that, we groan. We groan. There, there are some verses that I'm not worthy to preach. I don't want to preach them. I kind of bypass them all. There's an old song, For whatever it takes to draw closer to you, Lord. Anybody remember that old song, Bill Gates? That's what I'll be willing to do. I'll trade sunshine for rain, comfort for pain. I don't like that swap. That's what I'll be willing to do for whatever it takes for my will to break. That's what I'll be willing to do. That's why we groan. We all have a will, and it has to be broken. There was a man, an old preacher, tells a great story of a man who was going through the trials of his life, thinking that it will never get any better. So he just took off walking down the street. And he stopped at a construction of a church that was literally done, except for one man who was chipping away. And he watched the guy. Everything else is done. He said, why are you working so hard on this stone? The, the house is finished. I don't even see what, what you're doing. And he said, look, right up there, the steeple that is just being set. This is the stone that will set uh, and, the, and the steeple. It will center point off. What I'm doing is I'm working on it down here so it will fit in up there. The man going through many troubles understood God's message for him that day. He is working on us down here so we fit in up there. Because, folks, you're not going to take this with you. You ain't taking this with you. It's not going. It's temporary. What is eternal is made without hands, eternal in the heavens. It is a permanent structure. we got to get used to being more temporary. We keep hoarding up all of our life. I know people who, um, in fact, I was preaching at a church uh, back years ago. The pastor said, give me some advice. He, he said, uh, our church is sitting on some CDs, and we wonder what we should be doing. You know? I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, three-quarters of a million dollars in this one CD. 
and what do you recommend? I said, recommend get the checkbook out right now. Let's write a check and let's, let's get that money out so it can be used of God. They did not take my advice. What they were looking for was a better deal on how to keep what they had. Did you know the church is the only thing ever created by God that's supposed to come to the end of the year absolutely broke? We're, we're even and not a penny sticks. We're, we're to come through this whole thing as, as a storehouse, a warehouse, and then a transfer house. Blessings come in, blessings go out. In and out. We breathe in and out. So when we get to hoarding things or get to believing that we got to hang on to it, God can't use what we hold on to. That's why it's a hard, it's a hard thing to say, whatever it takes, Lord, for my will to break. And some of you are hard-willed. You've got a strong will. So whatever it takes, seriously, whatever it takes, whatever it takes for my will to break, that's what I'm willing to do. We groan because we cannot achieve that which we want. We earnestly desire to be better knowing that we can't. Now, the second, the second teaching is we are confident. Look with me, if you would, in, um, back in 2 Corinth. So, verse 6, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We're confident, yes, well, please, rather be absent from the body, present with the Lord. We are confident. Always, he said, we are always confident that we are at home in this body. You say, I don't get that at all. What does that mean? Again, it's back to this contrast. In this body, we're at home, temporary, this is it, not going to be any better. The older you get, the, the harder it is to move. Every part of the body begins to ache. Everything has a problem. Uh, everything has a consequence. Uh, every, every time you breathe and move about, the body is saying uh, what may or may not work today. He said, but we're at home in that knowing that this is us until God calls us home. I was on the end of a phone line to a man in the, on the Arkansas River bottoms, had his pickup locked up, two cops were outside, had me on the cell phone talking with him about why he should, should lay down that 7-millimeter magnum and, and lay it on the dashboard, unlock his truck so the officers can help him. We started in this process. Over and over we went. We went through the things that we're taught to say. We went through the things, talking about the body, talking about the family, talking about uh, problems and, and why they're not as big as you may think they are right now. So anyway, we went through all of that. I'm losing my voice, drinking, and, and we go back to it. Then he talks. I said, just lay, lay the pistol on the dashboard for a moment. No, I can't do that. I won't do that. Finally, I came to the end of this, and I said, look, you're going to do what you're going to do, but would you do me one favor? Would you get off this cell phone onto me? Would you call your mama and tell her? Because I'm going to have to go deal with your mama tomorrow. And you tell your mama that it's not her fault. Because for the rest of her life, your mama is going to think that this is her fault. Could you at least do that? About another 10 minutes, he finally laid the pistol down. We got through it. He became a manager of a parts place in Russellville, Arkansas. Became a Christian, never heard from him again. I only say that to say this. When we're begging people to try to say to them their life is important, that they matter, we run out of words. We run out of volume of what to do and what to say. We really do. We're not designed for that. But, folks, we are designed to live it in our body. That's what he's meaning. We live this out in our body every day. What? How, how come you don't react to the things that, that I react to the same way? Talking to unbelievers. It's because they're not at home in the body. I saw a lady the other day on television who, in an attempt not to reveal age, her, if her face gets any tighter, any tighter at all, her eyeballs are going to pop. Why? And it's so ugly. There's nothing more beautiful than a woman. Boy, I'm on shaky ground. <laughs> nothing more beautiful than a woman. We are very confident. From the body, present with the Lord, 
Absent from the Lord, present from the body. We know, he says, we're confident because the Holy Spirit is living in us. And until he takes me there, I'm here. And I'm comfortable with that. That's what Paul is saying. I'm comfortable in my clothes because one of these days, Jesus is coming again. The trump of God shall sound. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to be together with him forevermore in there. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, 18. That's going to happen. But until then, I'm going to keep walking and serving Jesus Christ. I'm going to be comfortable with the clothes I'm in. I'm going to be kind to everyone I am. And I'm also going to realize that this is a little old temporary house. I can't hoard it up. I can't have it all. I'll never get it all. And because of that, I'm willing to let it go. That's all he's saying. Are you all amen in that? I'll close if everybody says amen. (laughs) All right then. We are confident. We groan. We know what's happening underneath all of this. But we're confident that he gave us this Holy Spirit, the 100% money back guarantee that until he ends us in us, we're going to keep going. That's what we're going to do. We're going to move forward. There's a church up in New Jersey. I listened to the pastor preach. They have shut him down, shut his church down completely. Uh, completely unconstitutional. I I feel like there'll be hundreds of churches going to have to come to his rally to help him out because the state has deemed that uh, he broke a rule back there and they're going to make him pay and suffer for it. But what I'm saying is uh, his only word today to those people, we're going to move forward because the Holy Spirit is leading us. We're going to move forward. So I'm hoping that when you leave here to whatever your tomorrow is, there sits Dan and Dina. They lost their home. It's a great loss. I've, I've, I've watched the home burn down. I, I mean, I understand that loss. But they're still here serving Jesus the Christ less than 24 hours after their home burns down. Why? Why? Because, because it's temporary and they know it. And there's something better waiting for them and we know it. And that's why it's necessary to me to remind one another. Some of you who are going through the physical uh, illness and sadness uh, and emotional sadness of your life are here today. You are encouraged simply because you are reminded that the Holy Spirit is in you, not giving up on you, not quitting on you, and He is going to take you through until you're ready for that eternal place. Amen. Let's all stand together. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. My, what a crowd you've been this morning. To those of you viewers on our YouTube channel and those of you on our Facebook family, We thank you for being with us this morning. We pray that if we can be of any help to you, any way, shape, or form, that you'll let us know. Email us or call us uh, here at the church. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I've kind of been all over the map this morning. I just wanted to show you the tent. That's you. It's temporary. You're never going to get all your junk in there, folks. Quit Quit trying. Quit worrying about it. You're going to have to let some stuff go. Some of the things you're worrying about are temporary. You're going to have to let it go. Your health, your finances, your family, your future, your your children, grandchildren, uh, you're worried about the world that we are leaving them. I understand that, but you are filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the 100% money back guarantee. He's going to get you from the temporary to the eternal. Commit yourself this very day. Father, I can let it go. And as the songwriter said, for whatever it takes for my will to break, that's what I'm willing to do, whatever it takes. Many years ago, Jan and I were in Guatemala City at a building we had built called the Arkansas House. It's now a seminary. It was my fifth or sixth time there in 18 months. We knew... It was an unusual time in our life. We were sitting in this little bungalow, two little beds, and she said, Bob, if, if this is where you're saying the Holy Spirit is wanting us now to be missionaries here in Guatemala, if this is what we're going to do, just tell me so we can start praying. She was about eight steps ahead of me at that point, and that wasn't God's will for our, our life. But what she said way ahead of me on that that instance was for whatever it takes for my will to break that's what I'm willing to do I'll trade sunshine for rain comfort for pain 
That's what I'm willing to do. For whatever it takes for my will to break, that's what I'm willing to do. So 2 Corinthians 5 is just this great reminder of, folks, this is just a little old tent. You're not going to hang out here that long. Learn to live for the eternal. Get comfortable now in the clothes you're in because you're not going to get any more clothes of righteousness till you have a new body, a resurrected body. There's no soul sleep. He says, absent from the body is present with the Lord. There's no purgatory absent from the bodies present with the Lord. The moment you stop breathing here, you are ushered into the presence of God in heaven. So don't worry about it. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, up in the top, down below, on the floor. How many of you can say, preacher, I know beyond any shadow of doubt that I'm redeemed. I know that Jesus Christ lives in my heart. But I tell you right now, I'm a tough nut to break. I have a strong will. And I want you to pray for me because I want to yield my will to him this very day. That's me. I've got a strong will. You just lift your hand and say, preacher, that's me. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, my goodness gracious. We are a strong-willed people. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's true. We're strong-willed people. Maybe your prayer today is, Father, whatever it takes for my will to break. It's what I'm willing to do. I see politicians on the TV. I want to punch them out. I don't want to love them. I don't want to share scripture with them. I don't want to give them a track. I want to take them out. That's wrong. That's wrong. I see two men on a television screen kissing each other. I, I don't want to say Jesus loves you. I want to, I want to kick them. That's wrong. I'm never going to win anyone contrary to Christ with a violence toward them. So we, we've got some own work in our park to do as well. We really do. If you're here this morning and you need to intercede for another person or you need to say, I need to come to this altar and confess my sins to Jesus Christ, I need to ask him to save me this morning. That altar is open for you. I'll quit talking and let you do your business with the Lord. And then we'll be going home. But if you need to trust Christ right where you stand, this is the moment by which you can do that. This is the time to come to him and say, I confess to you, dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I confess that to you. I ask you to save me this day. In fact, you can pray that right where you stand. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I ask you, I ask you to take me into, into your grace. Lord, may I swap my sin for your righteousness right now. May I swap it. You take this old stained mind of mine and give me a new heart, a new mind. I ask it in Jesus' name. If you just prayed that prayer, slip out from where you are. Tell one of these preachers, I just asked Jesus into my heart. That's the next move for you. Father, this morning our hearts bow before you. We are strong-willed people. And sometimes, Lord, we as believers are arrogant in our beliefs. So I thank you for this text that reminds us of who we are in you and the 100% money-back guarantee that the Holy Spirit is going to get us through this stuff. We thank you for it. I pray for those, Heavenly Father, who, who need to come to you today. Lord, there's more than 100 people in this room that have shared that they do have a hard will to break. So I pray that they're doing business with you right now. I pray that you'll use that time in their life. If they need to come, I pray that they will. In Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. You need to use this altar this morning, it's open for you. You need to intercede for another, it's open for you.